And then after I run through that, that kind of brief overview of the mechanism itself, its purpose, the different types of MRDAs, and then the application process, then I, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, also, we wanted to share just a little kind of insider information with you all um, that we've learned over the course of doing a, a lot of review sessions um, for these MRDAs and, and kind of collecting uh, knowledge over, over the cycles as to what our reviewers are really looking for in these applications. So, um, let me see if I can forward this. So to start off with, and, and this is probably one of the most important things that, that we need to emphasize, is that the purpose of these Mentored Research Development Awards are to improve the success rate for grant submissions by our junior faculty. So um, the Mentored Research Development Award is a program within the Professional Development Core of the ASCEL program. And the Professional Development Core is really focused on improving the professional development of our investigators. Um, and this grant in particular is designed to help build grant writing skills, um, to have folks get feedback about their grant writing, um, and to help make sure that your grant proposals are successful. One thing that I wanna make perfectly clear is that these MRDAs do not fund research. Okay, so it's, this is different from the pilot program. Um, when you are requesting funds as part of the MRDA program, they need to be focused on improving the success of your grant application. And that doesn't include collecting pilot data. We'll talk about that in a little more detail as we go along. So that's the first most, that's probably the most important thing I have to, to say today. Um, across time, there have now developed different types of MRDA programs. So the original MRDA was really focused on helping clinical investigators write successful grant proposals. And what we had heard from clinical investigators is that the biggest barrier to them writing grant proposals and successful grant proposals is the lack of time that they're very busy doing clinical work, they don't have any research time carved out of that, that clinical schedule. And what they most needed was the ability to set time aside to be able to write. So that prompted the first version of the MRDA. And this option one is really focused on an offset um, of non-research, typically clinical effort, to provide time to develop the grant proposal. Um, so here, and this is directly out of the call for proposals, we're talking about where clinical investigators can receive coverage for up to 20% of their time over six months to work towards the goals of their award. So basically preparing that, that grant proposal. Half of that effort, so half of the percentage of the awardee's salary up to the NIH salary cap, cap is covered by the MRDA, and half is covered and protected by um, the clinician's division chief or department chair. And that time that's covered by the MRDA can be spread over an entire six month period. So for example, one day a week, or it can be compressed into a much shorter time frame, so like five continuous weeks of effort. And that's something that each investigator needs to work out with their mentoring team and their division chief or department chair. And what we ask you to do is to tell us in your proposal what your timeline is going to be and to justify that timeline. Um, so that's the, the first and, and traditional type of MRDA. When um, Delaware State University um, became involved in a cell, we realized that we needed to create a different type of mechanism um, that would be relevant for academics, not just clinicians. 
So this is option number two, and this MRDA provides an offset of teaching effort to provide time to devote to writing a grant proposal, plus some additional minimal funds. So here, and again, this is straight out of the RFA, academic investigators with scientific or engineering backgrounds who are seeking to develop a clinical or translational research proposal can receive coverage for expenses for up to 10% buyout or release from one course during one semester. In addition to that, that component of the MRDA, they can request additional funds to cover costs up to around $3,000 uh, for activities that are related to increasing the competitiveness of their grant proposal. And um, those sorts of things, again, that cannot be collecting pilot data, but it can be a range of different activities that I'll talk about in, in a minute. Our third type of MRDA has been developed specifically for um, investigators who already have research time built in to, their, to the structure of their position. So option three doesn't cover time because time isn't what these investigators need. They said instead that they really could use funds to support activities that would increase the competitiveness of their grant proposals. So this type of MRDA is for clinical or academic investigators who have sufficient protected time to write their grant proposal and to participate in all of the SL activities that we offer, but they lack other substantive grant writing supports that some funds would help them have access to. So here we're allowing costs up to $10,000 for various activities. And those activities could be things like travel to meet with mentors or collaborators uh, for the grant proposal, attendance at conferences or workshops that are focused on the topic area of the grant or are focused on grant writing specifically, technical training or professional development activities that would make you a more competitive investigator for, for the grant you're proposing, um, consultation regarding study design or data analysis that might be specialized um, and not under the, the expertise areas of the BIRD core, um, which is part of a cell. Resources or supplies, so if you need certain books to help you um, maybe do analyses or learn certain methodologies. Those sorts of things can be covered. If there are publicly available data sets that could provide you with some uh, basic information to help form hypotheses or something like that in your grant, um, we can help you purchase access or licenses to those data sets. Um, and then things like publication fees for manuscripts to help you uh, beef up your biosketch, um, or even grant editing, which sometimes can, can cost um, money. So again, those are all types of activities that would help increase the competitiveness of your grant proposal. They cannot be used to fund research. So just recently, for example, we had someone who was interested in this particular MRDA mechanism and what they were proposing was funds to create a stipend for an undergraduate to help them collect pilot data. That's, that cannot be part of the MRDA. And the reason for that is that any new data collection or newly proposed research would need to go back to NIH for approval, um, which is part of the typical process of like the pilot awards or things like that that are actually proposing research. These awards are not funding research, they're funding writing a grant proposal. Okay, so ho hopefully I've hammered that home enough. Um, now, any funds that are requested through this mechanism, so in lieu of effort, needs to be described and justified in a specific budget. So um, before I go on, any questions from, from you all about 
the different types of MRDAs. Okay. So there are two steps to putting in an MRDA application. Um, the first step is putting in a letter of intent, and those letter of intents for this particular cycle are due on August 20th. Um, the letter of intents are not evaluated in terms of scientific merit, um, and they're not evaluated in terms of like a gatekeeping mechanism. So after you submit your letter of intent, you're not going, you shouldn't await to hear, yes, you can submit. Um, anyone can submit. The only time that we will contact you when you submit a letter of intent is if there's something that's unclear in the material. And in these letters of intent, we ask for a number of elements that simply help us start to think about, well, who would be the best reviewers for this research? And are you moving in a direction that would lead you to a potentially successful application? So if we see any red flags with a letter of intent, we may reach out to you for clarification and to talk through some, some of the different options that you might have. So these letters of intent need to specify what the grant mechanism is that you're going to be applying for, including the due date for that. A general overview of the research that you're proposing, again, so that we can get an expert in that area to help review your application. You need to identify your sponsoring mentor, which is your primary mentor, and your mentoring team, if it goes beyond a primary mentor. You need to indicate if an effort offset is being requested and then provide the name of the individual who would release you from your clinical or other responsibilities if the MRDA is awarded. You need to indicate if funds are being requested in addition to or in lieu of an effort offset. And then also indicate the desired start date for the MRDA activities. And this particular, this particular RFA that we put out is focused on MRDA awards that would generally align with the spring 2022 academic semester. So basically we would think that you would start activities on these MRDAs around January and then finish them by the end of June. And again, the letter, the letter of intent is just to assign appropriate reviewers and ensure eligibility. Then after those letters of intent come in on the 20th, um, we would expect to receive an application from you on September 10th. Now you do have the option of submitting your applications a little bit early if you want us to review them um, quickly for the basics, make sure that all the elements are there um, and give you a little bit of feedback on, on that component. But, um, so, so you can turn them in earlier, but we need them by September 10th to make sure that we can do the reviews in a timely fashion and that they're evaluated um, by our executive committee in a timely fashion after that review happens. The application itself is, is pretty brief. We want a research summary. So here you're going to be describing the type of research you're going to be proposing in your grant application. So no more than two pages. Um, an MRDA plan, which basically tells us what are you going to be doing during those six months um, of your award to be able to create a, a competitive grant application. Um, a timeline, so we can see when you are going to achieve each of those different steps in your MRDA plan. And then also a draft budget request with justification for any funds that you're requesting um, that are non-salary components. So if, if you're requesting the type two MRDA where you're requesting time off from a class and then also some funds like to attend a workshop or something like that, we wanna know what you're going to, to like how much money that workshop would cost. If you are just requesting funds, we need to see a detailed budget of all of those different activities and elements and, and how much they're, they're going to cost. So that's the application itself. Then 
In addition to the application, you need to complete an online individual development plan. You need to submit bio sketches for yourself and all of your mentors, a detailed mentoring plan that you and your sponsoring mentor and potentially other mentors complete together um, that outlines how and what forms of mentoring you're going to be receiving during the course of the MRDA, and then letters of support um, from your mentors, from your division chief, um, uh, all the relevant players. So I want to spend a little bit of time kind of talking a bit about, about these elements um, based on what, what we've seen in, in recent reviews. Um, so first, the, the research summary is important, and it doesn't need to be exactly what you're going to propose in terms of your grant application, but it needs to be detailed enough that we know and we can see what direction you're going. And the reviewers can evaluate, is this something that's likely to be successful um, for grant funding for the mechanism that you've proposed? So for example, if you're preparing a pilot grant for a cell, is it something that describes translational research? Um, sometimes we do have applicants that uh, propose to put in numerous grant proposals, that's fine. Um, but we do want to make sure that what you're proposing to do is reasonable. So you also don't want to propose that you're going to be doing too much. Um, so if you're doing a multi-component plan for your MRDA, make sure that you provide clear timelines for what you're going to do, kind of how that plays out over the course of the MRDA, and specific information in your MRD plan as to how you're going to achieve each of those steps. Also, there are a number of different SL resources that all the MRD applicants um, avail themselves of. So there is a grant writing workshop that's, that's part of this. Um, you can have consultations with the Professional Development Corps, with the um, Biostatistics and Epidemiology Corps regarding research design and statistical analyses, with um, the Community Engagement Corps, so that you if you're a community engaged re researcher, you can uh, get help with that. All of those components, all of those cell based resources that you're going to be taking advantage of during the MRDA, you should specify in the MRDA plan. So we wanna see how you're going to connect to all of these, these resources and activities that, that we provide as part of SL. Um, some of those things in terms of the timeline might not be exactly clear, but, but that timeline, we want to see you talking about, okay, I'm going to engage in the grant writing course. Um, I'm going to develop a specific aims page by this date. I'm going to get feedback on it from my mentors by this date. I am going to um, share it with a peer review through a cell. Uh, by around this date and get feedback, incorporate that, and then have a final specific aims page by this date. So that, that's the kind of detail that reviewers want to see um, in, your, in your timeline. Um, and they're going to be evaluating that for reasonability. So, so we, we don't expect, unless you're doing something like, like a full week devoted to writing the grant, we don't expect you to have an entire grant written in a week. Uh, we expect this is something that's going to take some, some concentrated effort at times and then kind of waiting for feedback and then a revision process and then more feedback. Um, so those are, those are some tips and tricks about the application itself. Now, um, for the for the associated documents that we ask for, so for the IDP, we have templates for the IDP kind of built into the, the online system. And we really want to see two levels of plans in that individualized development plan. So we ask for 
general goals. So kind of thinking about a five-year plan, what do you want to accomplish? And in that plan, think through, if it's relevant, what do you want to accomplish first and foremost in your research program? And then also in your clinical program, in your teaching program, in your professional development. So we want to see um, goals in terms of each of those different areas to make sure that, that you're well-rounded as an investigator in terms of what makes sense for your specific, um, your specific uh, position. Okay, so um, if you're a clinician at Christiana, that might look very different from if if you're um, a, an educator professor at Delaware State. Okay, so we want to see that overall large plan. Then we also want to see very specific goals um, with a focus on what you're going to do during the timeline of your MRDA. And we want to see SMART goals. So these need to be things that are specific, that are measurable, and I'm not going to remember all of the, the uh, what all the, the letters of SMART stand for, <laughs> um, but they're actionable, um, and they're something that can be completed in, in due course, so, so something specific. Um, we even ask, in some cases, like, well, what is the next thing that you're going to work on before your next meeting with your mentor? Okay. And we, so we want those two different levels of goals, broad goals, and then very specific time limited goals that are going to help you move towards those broader goals. Um, we also want to see some connections between these different goals. So if, for example, you have, a teaching goal or a clinical goal, how do those goals fit in with your research goals to, to create kind of a, a coordinated path forward for you? Okay, and, and, I, and I hope that, that makes sense. So we wanna see this, this neatly tied together package um, that you plan to, to work towards. Um, in terms of the bio sketches, we want the bio sketches to be consistent with the current NIH format. NIH is currently in transitioning from one format to, an, to another format. The new format is not technically required until January, so either of those two formats um, we would accept for now. Um, so the format is important to have it in the right format. The other piece that's really important is that the bio sketch of your sponsoring mentor should specifically talk about your mentor's um, capabilities as a mentor, specifically for you and for this project. And that might be different from their typical research bio sketch, okay? Let me say that again, because this is important. Their bio sketch should specifically link to what they are going to be doing for you as a sponsoring mentor, why they're qualified to be a mentor to you and to this project, and a bit about their prior experience as a mentor. So we can judge, are, are they the right person for you and for this project. Now your sponsoring mentor might not have all the experiences or expertise that you need to be successful as an investigator. And that's where your mentoring team comes into play. So you may have other mentors with specific expertise um, or specific experiences to help round out your mentoring team to make sure that you are getting all the support that you need. One thing that is very important about this mentoring team is at least one of your mentors should be at your institution. 
And that mentor should help you work through all of the processes at your institution. For example, working with your Office of Sponsored Projects um, to get the grant submitted. Um, helping you negotiate things like if there are problems, um, making sure that the time that you were supposed to have protected from your clinical time actually is protected, that mentor should help you with that. Because of that potential role, it's important that your sponsoring mentor or some other mentors on your team are not the are not your division chief or the person to whom you directly report. Okay, and if there's any questions or confusion about that, uh, please reach out to me or Aaron for further guidance. One thing we've seen over and over again in our, our reviews is that our reviewers don't want you to be reporting only to one mentor who is your division chief. We, we want you to be kind of stretching beyond that person so that any kind of dual roles that you run into with that mentor um, have kind of a check and a balance. Also, um, the mentoring plan is very important and again, needs to be quite detailed. And the mentoring plan needs to be developed in collaboration with your mentor and in fact, I, your mentor is the one who submits this plan. We wanna see details there, like how often you're going to be meeting with your mentor, what specific areas and topics that the mentor is going to help you with. For example, if, if your mentor is one that has specific expertise in a certain methodology, how are they gonna help you learn that methodology? How are they gonna help you write that section of your grant? Um, if that mentor is someone who is really successful in writing grants, how are they gonna help review aspects of your grant, help you understand the grant review process, um, help you work with your Office of Sponsored Projects to get your grant submitted? How are they gonna fulfill all of those roles? So again, we wanna see some detail here um, so that the reviewers are convinced that you have all the supports around you that you need to be successful. And then, of course, the letters of support help, help us see both how the, the mentors kind of are evaluating your chances of success, um, any kind of lo last, like longer relationships they've had with you, any previous experience they've had with you, or if it's a new relationship. And, and again, those letters of support can provide additional information in addition to the biosketch the mentoring plan and the IDP um, that are important to evaluating the entire package. So let me pause again and see if there are any questions on all that. I know that was a lot of information. Okay, so when these MRDA applications are reviewed. There are two different components that we look at carefully. Um, one is the mentoring team. And um, there, there are times that reviewers will feel that a package for, is really strong. And we think that there is, is a good possibility that the investigator would be capable of writing a really strong grant application, but they're just missing like a small component of a mentoring team. So there, there are times when we may go back to an investigator and, and say, we want you to add another mentor. Um, after we've decided that we think that the, the, the application is good for funding. Um, it's best to try to make sure that you have all those pieces in place in advance. So these are the sort of, these are the things that we're going to the reviewers are asked to look at when we're evaluating these grant applications. So the sponsoring mentor's level of experience 
and expertise to guide you in preparing this highly competitive grant submission. And reviewers will even look at, is that mentor good for this particular type of grant mechanism? So if you're interested in writing a K award, do they have experience guiding folks to write successful Ks in the past? If you're looking to propose um, an R01, has this mentor had successful had success with R01 applications in the past? Um, we want to make sure again that you have a complete mentoring team, and I've talked about that a bit, and that the different roles of the different me mentors on your team are clear. Um, the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of the mentoring plan and its potential to support you in the activities that were proposed during the MRDA period. And then we're also looking at the appropriateness of your individual development plan and the inclusion of those SMART goals and timelines for goal achievement. And I've talked a bit about, about all of those elements. So in addition to this mentoring component of the review, we're also looking at the merit of your proposal. And here, the reviewers are specifically asked to evaluate the likelihood of your success in competing for an external grant. And that's based on a few things. For example, the mentor's assessment of your research potential, which might come across in their letter of support. Um, and then also what the reviewer feels about kind of the completeness and, um, and the story that comes across in how you're presenting your research. Relevance of the Envision grant proposal to the ASCEL mission. So although all meritorious applications are considered for funding, in cases where multiple applications are ranked at the same level of merit, priority is given to applications that are focused on areas of high importance determined by ASCEL. And those include cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, big data, obesity, women's health, and infant mortality. We also encourage submissions describing community engagement research and or addressing social determinants of health, health disparities and equity, and substance use. Um, ASCEL has also identified three additional areas of high importance that include rehab, preventative care, and behavioral and mental health. So there are a lot of different areas that ASCEL is interested in supporting. Um, it's, it's a little hard to imagine some topics that might fall outside of those areas, but those, those areas are the ones that are high priority right now. Reviewers also consider the scope of your proposal and the likelihood of successfully accomplishing all of the objectives that you propose in your MRDA plan. Um, they also look at the availability of collaborators, core lab resources, analytic tools, and other relevant resources to support you. So um, to what extent would plugging into these various ASCEL resources help you do your research and then, and therefore um, write an effective grant application? And then, of course, the feasibility of all of this. So we, we don't want to see you proposing too much that we think it's, it's impossible for you to do in, in the timeline um, that, that you're laying out. So I think that's it for my slideshow. I'll stop sharing that. Um, I'm, and I know that we don't, we don't have that many folks on right now, but what questions do you have? What thoughts come to mind? Is anything that I've said unclear or is anything written in the RFA unclear that I can answer questions about? Okay, if there are no questions, then I'm going to throw it to Aaron and ask Aaron, what did I forget to tell them? You did an awesome job. You covered a lot of things, but I'll just reiterate stuff. So um, I've been doing the MRDA program for nine years now, so I've heard a lot of reviews. 
And some of the comments, you could take out the investigator's name or the mentor's name, and it's a, a theme in the comments that you hear. So um, just some things that I'll reiterate that Melissa already said. Um, while the mentor, the MRDA plan and the science of your work is very important, please take extra care when you're doing the mentoring plan and the IDP, because sometimes I think people think they're just submitting a scientific grant and they don't realize that the value is really placed on the review of the IDP and the mentoring plan. So those are really important to look at. Um, so when thinking about the IDP, SMART goals, that's come up time and time and time again. In fact, if anyone needs a Word document or a form to help you write out those SMART goals, um, I'm happy to do that or send that to you so you have it. The mentoring plan is important because it should match the mentoring plan, what's in there, as well as what goes in the letter from the mentor. Sometimes um, we get two mismatches of information and it's a red flag that you know either the mentor didn't look at the letter, maybe didn't complete the mentoring plan, it wasn't done in conjunction together. So before you submit your package, go through everything with a fine tube comb if you can um, and look for things like that. Simple things on the bio sketch, like having it on an outdated form, that's also a red flag. So make sure you're using the form that has the correct um, expiration date, I call it, on it. Um, so make sure that's up to date as well. Um, I'm here all the time to answer questions. So if you're starting to write your MRDA, you're working on an IVP, um, the website's acting out, please don't hesitate to you know reach out to myself and anything I don't know, I bug Melissa. So um, we wanna be here as a resource. So you didn't think that the process to submit an R MRDA was you know overburdensome because it's not meant to be at all. Um, so we wanna make sure that's clear. Um, with some of the questions that I get a lot are, can my mentor not be from an Excel institution? The answer to that is yes. But what you wanna think about is in that case, who's gonna be your mentor at your institution? Um, because that's something that will come up a lot is that somebody's mentor may not, may not be part of the program. So can they really guide them or do they really understand what how it works at the institution? So I would just encourage you in that case, think of a mentoring team. Um, with that being said, you then have to do the added work of coordinating what the team is going to do. So the in mentor's letter or in the mentoring plans, it should be specific what that mentor is going to add to your um, career development and your research development. So if they're just an institutional mentor, that's okay. Or if maybe they're your science mentor, that's okay. But how will they work together? Um, that's important. Um, those are, I think, some of the big things I hear a lot. Um, just, I just say, make things clear to the reviewers. Rob Akins, if he was here today, would say, think of the reviewers as a bunch of individuals who are tired, overworked, and um, you know want to help you, but they don't want to have to go looking for things or hunting for things or trying to read between the lines. So um, it doesn't hurt to have someone who is not familiar with your work or your grant or anything, read it before you submit it um, because they'll catch things that maybe you are too close to see. So um, other than that, like I said, we're here as a resource. We're happy to help along the way. Whatever you need, just let us know. Please don't get overly stressed over this. Um, that's why we're here to help, so. Thanks, Erin. And we, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one asks how many awards will be given so that is something that we don't know. Um, so the process is we get in the applications, we identify reviewers, um, they review the applications, we have a, um, a, a review session, and then we recommend to executive council for a cell the ones that we think ought to be awarded. The number of awards is determined by the budget, um, and, and those are things that we don't know. Um, and sometimes we, so, and so we often don't know that ahead of time, um, and we don't have a say in that. And the, so the executive committee makes the final decisions as to how, how many are awarded. Um, also, we're asked who is ineligible for the program, non-U.S. citizens, et cetera. So the, these MRDAs are specifically for applicants who qualify um, 
who fulfill the criteria of an NIH new investigator. And a link to that definition is right in the RFA. So check that out. That simply that you haven't had an R01 before um, or other large grant. Um, U.S. citizen, Aaron, I, I don't know the answer to that. Do you? I guess my question would be, would, be, would they be eligible to apply for NIH grants? Um, if the answer is no, they can't, I would assume they would not be able to because, uh, uh, you know, a goal is for our MRDA awards to apply for NIH, AHA, PCORI, AHRQ, what, you know, something along those lines. So if they don't have the eligibility to do that, I don't think they would be eligible for this program. But if, if that's um, a concern or a question for you, Carolyn, I'm happy to find out from our UD um, OSP person. Just let me know if you need me to ask. Another thing just to mention, this this is the first time, and with the, with the third option for the MRDA, this is the first time that folks um, at University of Delaware um, actually qualify, uh, are eligible for, for these grants. So um, please do spread the word. Um, we we want to get in as many applications as we can and get the word out about, about that new uh, development. And for folks who are out there, um, just two quick things. One is if you are working within the website and, you know, you think you hit save and you hit submit or um, something's not there that you know you attached or anything along those lines, um, just be aware there is a help option on the website. So when you log in in the upper right, you have initials. Um, there is a button that says help and you can put in a ticket and they're very good about timely responding to your concerns, questions, issues. So I don't want anyone to uh, you know, panic, but they, they'll be able to assist you. Uh, and then the other plug that I make is for folks, now is not too early to start writing your IDPs, your mentoring plans to get biosketches, to start your own biosketch. Because um, we have found over the course of the years, a lot of investigators put those kind of off to the end but really, when you get to the end, you really want to just be fine tuning your application. You don't want to be starting your bio sketch and you don't want to be, you know, just starting that IDP because those are very important pieces. And so now is not too early to start those pieces. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And if anyone has questions or concerns, we also host a Thursday morning chain call it's every Thursday at 9 a.m. So if you're doing something within the application, you want a pretty quick response. We have those calls every Thursday. That is not a holiday. So you can pop on and just say, hey, I'm having a problem with accessing the IDP or I hit save. I needed to go back to draft. We're there. We'll help you. Um, it's a quick touch base call. So feel free to jump on those as well. OK, any any last thoughts? All right, well, I hope that this was helpful. And again, if you do run across any questions, feel free to reach out to Aaron and to me. Um, and we're, we're always here to answer questions about this and, and we just want to get the word out and, and help make these applications successful. Thanks everybody, happy writing. Bye-bye everyone.